السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم I wanted to welcome you here on behalf of uh, MCWS and uh, as well as the uh, sponsors of uh, our uh, honored guest, Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah. Uh, we have the Beacon Foundation who you know, invited him and brought him here, alhamdulillah. And then we also have the American Learning Institute for Muslims, Alim, uh, which also is a co-sponsor, you know, alhamdulillah. So, and then lastly, the uh, MSA in uh, Ann Arbor. Uh, at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Alhamdulillah is also a co-sponsor. So we're very blessed to have Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah. I will leave the introduction to our uh, beloved Sheikh Ali Suleiman. Uh, but you know, before that, I, I wanted to make you aware and so that you could take advantage of the different events that we have uh, with Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah that we have planned. Uh, so of course, we're already at this, uh, we're at this event right now uh, and uh, here he's going to be talking about the parameters of respecting differences of opinion in Islam. So alhamdulillah, we'll hear from him on that. Tomorrow uh, at the Muslim Center at 1 p.m., the Muslim Center in Detroit, uh, he's going to be covering tracing our roots, African Muslims in America before Columbus. And so that's at 1 p.m. Sunday, uh, November 24th, so this Sunday, getting our minds right, how Muslims seek the truth in the modern age. And that's at Tawheed Center in Farmington Hills, inshallah, 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. Now, all of these, again, I had mentioned that they're sponsored, and sorry, I had missed the sponsor, MEP, uh, which is the Muslim Enrichment Project, uh, and uh, Brother Salim Khalid and uh, others from our community are also involved with uh, this, uh, with a special attention to our uh, you know, convert brothers and sisters. And, uh, so they're doing a lot of great work all over the metro Detroit area. Alam, the American Learning Institute for Muslims, uh, is an institute that has been around for a long time, was started in Michigan, and is focused on actually our tradition of critical thinking, the tradition within Islam of critical thinking uh, as applied to the Islamic sciences. And uh, you know, alhamdulillah, our Sheikh Ali Suleiman, Dr. Uh, Abdul Hakim Jackson, Sherman Jackson, uh, Dr. Munir Farid, and uh, Dr. Omar Farouk Abdullah has also taught there many times. And there's a summer institute that is a month-long institute that uh, occurs right here in Michigan. So inshallah, take advantage of that. And uh, they have a winter program coming up in Dallas. Um, I think so. Without further ado, I will ask uh, Sheikh Ali Suleiman to come up and introduce Dr. Omar, and uh, then we will begin. Stay up here, right? Yeah. You're going to stay up here, right? No, you, you don't have to do that. Stay up here. You're not going to leave me up here by myself. Inshallah, where's my glasses? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. It is my privilege and pleasure to introduce to you our beloved and prominent scholar, Dr. Omar Farooq Abdullah. Maybe he doesn't remember, but I met Dr. Omar in 1981 in Toronto. I was a student at the University of Toronto when Omar Dr. Omar came to give a talk in Jamia Mosque. Hmm. I met him over there, and I talked to him, and he gave me very wonderful advice. I thank you for that, Doctor. So <clears throat> I was given this responsibility to introduce our beloved and scholar, Sheikh, Dr. Omar Al-Farooq, converted after reading autobiography of Malcolm X, PhD, University of Chicago. The title of his thesis, Amal, Amal in Light of Malik Legal Theory. I read that thesis. I benefit from the thesis when I was writing my PhD thesis at the University of Michigan. Endowed professor at the University of Michigan in the 70s. Taught Arabic in Grenada, Spain, 
taught Islamic studies and comparative religion at King Abdul Aziz in Jeddah. You know what that mean? Omar, Professor Omar taught in King Abdul Aziz University for so many years. Has studies with many traditional scholars all over the world, including Saudi Arabia. Was affiliated with Norway Foundation in Chicago. Faculty at Darul Qasim in Chicago, along with Sheikh Ahmed Hul Wadia. Has taught at Alim with Dr. Jackson and Sheikh Ali Suleiman, as well as teaching many classes with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Currently teaching a class on Mondays at a mosque in Chicago established by the boxer Muhammad Ali, known as, his first and uh, former known as Kashos Kali. All of his know Muhammad Ali. That can be seen over the web with Sheikh Ubaidullah Evans on Ghazali's Ihya Ulum al-Din. Wonderful book. Publications. Audio set on the four principal imams in their legal schools. This is very, very, very wonderful and uh, audio. I think I will encourage all of us to have it and listen to it. Brother Harris, I um, promise to send me a copy. <laughs> the Islamic struggle in Syria, a Muslim in Victoria, America, the life of Alexandra Russell Webb, Malik and Medina, Islamic legal reason, reasoning in the formative period, Abu Hanifa, radiallahu anhu, in encyclopedia, um, and many others. So I think if we, I will uh, sit here telling you about Omar talking about it, I think that will take the whole and the lecture. So we will leave Sheikh, our Sheikh, to talk to all of us here, inshallah. I want to go and sit in my place, but he asked me to right. stay with him here. I don't know. Please stay here. Anyway, they took your seat. They took your seat. You have to stay here, inshallah. Saman uh, wa Can we raise it a little bit? <coughs> oh, okay, how's that? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, was Sallallahu Ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa Ala Alihi wa Sahbihi wa Sallam. Allah Maftah Halena bi Hikmatika wa Nshur Alena bi Rahmatika Yadha al Jalali wal Ikram. Allah Masalli wa Sallim Mubarak Ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa Ala Alihi. عدد كمال الله كما يليق بكماله يا عليم علمنا من علمك ما ترضى به عنا ولا تآخذنا بما تعلمه منا يا حليم خلقنا بخلق الحلم وحققنا بحقائق العلم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم It is a great honor and a great joy for me to be here with you in Canton and Chicago and this part of Michigan are actually very close doesn't take us long to go back and forth. And for many of us in both areas, um, our lives overlap. Many of you go to Chicago for a time. Many people in Chicago come here for a time. And I spent some of the most important and best years of my life here, 1978 till 1982, teaching at the University of Michigan. So when I come back here, uh, it's very special. I know the place, I recognize faces, and when I see the things that you have accomplished during these last 31 years, it's really amazing. 
And may Allah bless all of your efforts and enable you to go further and further and to really, really develop these communities as fully as they can be developed. The topic tonight is about the parameters for dissent. That in Islam we have parameters, we have rules, we have limits that indicate to us how we can live together, what things we need to agree upon and not differ regarding and other things that are open to different interpretations. So this is an extremely important part of Islam. Two of the most important aspects of religion as a dynamic social and political reality are community and continuity. Community that we're able to create a community that brings people together. And especially when we talk about a world religion like Islam and a religion that has finality like ours because there is no prophet after our prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, then community is absolutely essential. We have to be able to live together. We have to be able to work together. We have to be able to be creative together. We have to do together the task of this religion. So community and continuity, which means that we are connected to the past and the present and the future. That we are not upsprings that just appeared overnight like mushrooms, that we have roots, we have a tradition that gives us meaning and that goes back to the Blessed Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So when we talk about the parameters of dissent in Islam, we are talking about community and we are talking also about maintaining continuity community and continuity. One of the great things about Islam is that Islam was not just a religion, it was not just a community of belief, but it was a great civilization. And it was a civilization that among the many things that it accomplished, one of the most remarkable of them all was world community. So that Islam became, it is said, like a peacock's tail that spread from the east in China to the west in the Atlantic Ocean of West Africa. And it had in it all the variety of that tail, all of the color, all of the beauty, but it was one tail, it was one entity. It's also been said, speaking about the same thing, that Islam in history, speaking about the great history of Islam as a world civilization. It was like a river, the water of which was crystal clear. The water has no color. The water is transparent. And that water reflected always the color of the rocks that it flowed over. So if the rocks at the bottom of the river were green, the river looked green. But the taste was the same. The water was the same. If it flowed over sand, like the Niger River, where it begins in, in, in the African desert, then it looked like sand. But it was still the same water. It was still the same pure water. So this is the way that Islam was. Islam in China, looked extremely Chinese, and yet it was pure Islam. Hanafi, Sunni, very, very conservative, but very Chinese at the same time. Islam in India, 
was Islam, but it looked Indian. Islam in East Africa was Islam, but it looked East African. When you go to West Africa, Islam is still that same life-giving water, but it is West African. So this is a remarkable thing, and this is one of the necessities of religion in the modern age that we must be able to live this religion of Islam and to bring it back to life so that we can let that river flow again with its pure waters. And this is not possible unless we are able to live together and to respect each other and to work together and to cooperate and to have love for each other. This is what release, releases in us great happiness. This is also what releases in us tremendous potential for creativity. So the parameters of dissent are absolutely, absolutely critical to the health of that river, to the reality of that river. And we'll talk about that a little bit tonight. But I think that a good place to begin is in the obligation to enjoin right and to forbid wrong. All of us know that this is one of the most important obligations of Islam, that we enjoin what is right and that we forbid what is wrong. However, we also know that when we study this religion, we are taught how to do that so that it becomes something constructive and respectful and positive and not something destructive and negative. Enjoining, commanding the right, for example, would seem to imply that we shout at each other, do this, or that we, when we forbid it, that we shout at each other, don't do this. Okay, but it doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean, it means simply to tell people, to guide people to what is right and to guide them away from what is wrong. And in this there is great adab, there is great courtesy that is required of us. For example, one of the most important things in enjoining right and forbidding wrong is that we must have knowledge. Knowledge of what? That we must know that the thing that we want to teach our community to do is an obligation. That it is not, for example, something that is recommended, mandub, because we are not allowed to command other Muslims to do what is mandub, what is recommended. We can urge them to do that. We can talk about how excellent it is. We can embody that in our lives. But what is mandub is something that you do not reprehend a person who doesn't do it. So first of all, we have to have knowledge. We have to have knowledge that this thing that we're going to enjoin is obligatory. Not just that it is obligatory, but that it is obligatory without question. Because of the fact that in Islam, we have different opinions about things. And those different opinions about things are based in the very nature of Islamic law. So therefore, when we enjoin something that is right, we have to know that it is a matter of obligation about which there is no difference of opinion. So it's not just a Shafi'i opinion, or a Hanafi opinion, or a Maliki opinion, or a Hanbali opinion, or someone else's opinion. It is a matter of consensus. In other words, it pertains to that aspect of the religion which we call Qat'i. 
that aspect of the religion which is absolutely solid ground that everyone agrees on. It is not allowed for me to enjoin a community to do something which would be obligatory for me because I follow Imam Malik if, for example, Imam Abu Hanifa doesn't hold the same opinion and Imam Shafi'i doesn't hold it either or Imam Ahmed. So therefore you have to have knowledge. And many times when we attempt to enjoin right or to forbid wrong, we cause great trouble in the community because the thing that we are insisting upon is our own opinion. It is our own custom. It is something that we are acquainted with. And we think everybody should do it, but we don't know. Okay, and then also when it comes to forbidding wrong, again, we don't shout at people about that. But here we have to know that the thing that is wrong is really wrong. And that means again that it is haram, not that it is makruh. Because there are many things in Islam, as you know, which are makruh. They are reprehensible. They are disliked. But we don't say anything about them. We don't um, blame a person because he or she is doing something which is makruh. We can't do that. We can pray for them. We can also use wisdom to get them to do something better. But we, here we don't do forbidding what is wrong because this is not haram, this is makruh. So we have to have knowledge. Then also, as before, we have to know that this matter that is haram is something that Abu Hanifa believes is wrong, haram, and Malik, and the Shafi'i, and Ahmed ibn Hanbal. So it has to be a matter of consensus. Really, really important. Really important. Okay, so these are the things then that are qat'iyat. They are definitive matters. And they are the solid ground upon which we build the castle of our community. And other matters, they can be extremely important matters. And they can be matters that are taken very seriously in our religion. But if they are not matters of consensus, then we do not bother people about them. We can teach them, we can urge them to do the better thing, we can uh, exemplify that in ourselves. So these are the kind of things that enable us to bring together communities of very diverse elements and to live in harmony with each other and to grow together and to love each other. Because one of the most important things is to learn to speak beautiful words, right? The Prophet told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that a person speaks a word that contains the pleasure of Allah. Kalimatun min ridwani lahi ta'ala he has no idea that it will lead to what it leads to. And because he speaks that word, Allah records for him, writes for him his pleasure until the day of judgment. Just a beautiful word you said. You didn't even think anything of it. But this word has such great value with Allah that he wrote his pleasure for you for the rest of your life until you meet him on the day of judgment and he transforms you. And the Prophet also told us that a person says a word, min sakhatillah. He says a word that earns the wrath of Allah. Maybe he or she backbites somebody horribly. Maybe they turn them over to the secret police. We have a brother who was just killed in Syria. May Allah have mercy upon him and his wonderful family. And when, his, when he was taken, this beautiful brother, his mother had told him, if they ever take you, you don't say a thing. Don't turn in anyone. And, you know, miskin, Allah have mercy upon him. That's what he did. 
That's what he did. He wouldn't say anything. And the secret police were, were punishing him. They were torturing him, trying to get him, tell us about so-and-so, tell us about so-and-so. He wouldn't do it, and they killed him. May Allah give him the Jannah. Okay? But the person speaks a word of Sakhatillah. Okay? Like maybe he turned in somebody. Like, okay, don't beat me anymore. I will tell you where he is. And maybe Allah forgives us that. And maybe he doesn't. So he says the word of Sakhatillah and Allah. And he doesn't think that it will come to anything. مَا ظَنَّ أَنَّهَا تَبْلُغُ مَا بَلَغَتْ he doesn't think that it will come to what it came to, but because of it, Allah writes down for him his wrath until the day of judgment, and it transforms his life. We have to be careful about what we say. The Prophet told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-kalimatu tayyiba sadaqah, right? It's a sahih hadith in Muslim. He said that the beautiful word is, is a charity. You know, we say beautiful words to each other, right? That's what we have to do. The Prophet said that Aysarul Ibadat, the most easy, do you want to know what is the easiest type of worship? I do. What is the most convenient type of worship? Aysarul Ibadati wa akhafu ala al badan, au kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ahwanuha ala al badan, au kama qala sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Asamt wa husnul khuluq. Silence and good character. You can do that. We can try to do that. Man kana yu'minu billahi wal yawmil akhir. Fal yaqul khayran aw li yasmut. Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, let him speak good or keep silent. So the beautiful word, and this beautiful word is our secret. The Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ma dalla qawmun kanu ala hudin, hudan aw kama qala, illa wa utul jadal. He says there's no people that went astray. Dallu ba'da hudan kanu alayh, aw kama qala. There's no people that went astray after they were on a type of guidance, but that they were immersed in what? Controversy, argument, fighting in each other's faces. We don't want to be like that, brothers and sisters. And you are not like that. If you were like that, you wouldn't have this beautiful community together today. You know, we are people who love each other and respect each other. It is not allowed for us to speak to our brother or sister in words that hurt them, in words that, that, that harm them. We cannot even look at our brother. It is haram for us to look at our brother or sister with a gaze that harms them. Yu'zi. We can't do that. So this is all. These are the secrets that made that river run. Pure water. Water of ikhlas. Water of sidq. And it was able to bring in the Chinese, the Central Asians, the Malays, the Indonesians, the Africans, every people in the world. And we hope and pray that Allah will enable us to see that beautiful river flow again in the United States and in Canada and in the world, bi-ithnillahi ta'ala. So we have to have knowledge. We have to be careful about what we say. Thank you very much. Another thing is that it is not permissible for us to enjoin right or to forbid wrong until we know for sure that when we do so, it won't create greater harm. Okay, that's very important because it may be that the brother or sister is doing something haram and it's a matter of consensus. And it may be also that they are not doing something obligatory and it's a matter of consensus. But before you speak, you have to know how, what will be the reaction? What, what will be the consequence? 
we have to use our minds. So it may be that, yes, you could tell them this, but they won't accept it, and maybe they will never come back to the mosque, and maybe it will lead to greater trouble. So that means that, not that we don't now do anything, but that we have to go about this very carefully. This is one of the reasons also why when we enjoin right and we forbid wrong, the best way to do it is in private, not in public. We don't get up in each other's faces. We are people that love each other. We are people that have to speak beautiful words to each other. We are people who want to make the bonds of love between us stronger and stronger and stronger. And we want to get better and better and better. And I want you to teach me what I need to know. And you also want to learn things that you don't know. But always we have to size up the situation. Because it may be, for example, that this person will not listen to you at all. Maybe they are on the verge of leaving Islam in the first place. That's why we have to be very careful about the way that we talk to people. We've got to, from the, we've got to, uh, we've got to assess the negative potential of what we do. Yes, we should tell this person that this is obligatory, that this is fundamental, or we should tell them that it is forbidden. But then, will they listen? How will they react? Once Ibn Taymiyyah, may Allah be pleased with him, was walking by some Tatars. And the Tatars are the soldiers of the Mongols. Okay, they're not actually Mongols, they are soldiers of the Mongols. But these Tatars weren't Muslims. You know, or if they, I think maybe they were Muslims, but they were brand new Muslims. And they were doing things that were outrageous. And one of Ibn Taymiyyah's students, perhaps it was Ibn Qayyim, may Allah be pleased with them both, he said, why don't we tell them that what they're doing is forbidden? I think they were maybe drinking wine. Okay? And he said, leave them alone. Because if you tell them not to do that, they may start killing people. They may start doing other things. See, so he said, just leave it alone. This is not the time to do that. Ultimately, the Tatars would become very good Muslims. Ultimately, the Tatars would build Islamic civilization again. They would contribute in an amazing way. But this was in the very beginning. The other thing that we have to know is that from a positive side, will this actually benefit that person? So these are very close, aren't they? Will it cause greater harm? Because in Islam, we are always concerned first and foremost about harm. One of the rules of Islamic law is that if ever there are, if whenever we consider a deed that we want to do, that if the benefit we expect from that deed is equal to the harm that might come out of the deed, then do we do it or not? What is the rule? No. Okay, if benefit and harm are potentially equal, we do not do that deed. The benefit has got to outweigh the harm. And that's why whenever potential harm is greater than the good we expect, we can't do that thing. We don't take chances with harm. This is basic Islamic law. These are basic principles of Islamic law. So they're very important. So the first thing is that if we enjoin right or forbid wrong, will it cause harm? Will it cause greater harm? Because if it does, it is not permissible to do it. It is not permissible to enjoin right or forbid wrong. And the other thing is that will it actually cause benefit? They're very similar, aren't they? But they're not ide identical because it may be that this won't cause harm, but it will not benefit this person because he or she won't listen, they won't take it seriously, it's a waste of time. 
and so forth. This is Islamic law. And these are also parameters for dissent. That in our community, we must cultivate knowledge. And we must understand that certain aspects of this beautiful religion are absolutely certain. They are what we call qat'iyat. They are definitive matters that if you believe in the Qur'an and if you believe in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you've got to believe this thing. It is qat'i, it is definitive. Such as, for example, that God is one. He has no partner, he has no son. Such as the fact that there will be resurrection of the dead such as the fact that there is the garden and there is the fire. Okay, and such as the fact that we have to pray five times a day. And we have to fast the month of Ramadan. Okay, these are all qat'iyat. They are also called usul al-din. They are called the foundational principles of the religion. Okay, and then we have around them thousands of issues which are what we call dhaniyat. They are matters that are open to interpretation. They are matters that require ijtihad. They require scholars who are very well trained and who have sound methodologies and extensive knowledge who can look into them and say that this is the opinion that I believe is the strongest. And one of the reasons why we respect so greatly Abu Hanifa and Malik and Ash-Shafi'i and Ahmad ibn Hanbal was because they were mujtahids like this. They were people that had extensive knowledge of the law. They distinguished very carefully between what was definitive and rock bottom, and things that were not. And in the case of Imam Malik, may Allah be pleased with him and all of the great Imams of Islam. In the case of Imam Malik, one of his principles is called Ri'ayatul Khilaf. Ri'ayatul Khilaf, which means heeding different opinions, taking different opinions seriously. So Imam Malik, for example, if there, there are certain types of marriage which, in his opinion, are completely invalid. They don't count from the beginning. They're called mefsukh. They're mefsukh. They don't have any validity whatsoever. In types of marriage like that, which are structurally and formally wrong, then as soon as they come to the attention of the judge, he will separate the husband and wife. And if during the period of waiting of the wife, who's now, she's like she's been divorced because the marriage is not valid, let's say that she would die during that time, or that he would die during that time, there will be no mutual inheritance because their marriage wasn't valid in the first place. You know that if you marry, then if the husband dies, his wife has a right to inheritance. And if she dies, she ha he has a right to her inherit, to part of her inheritance. All of you know that. The thing is, if you divorce your wife and she is in the waiting period and the husband should die during that time, or she should die during that time, there will still be inheritance because the divorce is not finalized. So in the case of Imam Malik, in the annulling, the voiding of very invalid marriages that were just done wrong, they're not valid. If he knew, for example, that Imam Abu Hanifa had a different opinion about that marriage, and he would say that maybe it's a makruh marriage. Not recommended, but it is not totally void. 
Then Imam Malik would still annul the marriage because he believes it's not valid, but he would give rights of inheritance during the waiting period. Why would he do that? Out of respect of Imam Abu Hanifa. Because he knew that these are ijtihadi matters. These are things that require ijtihad. And most of Islamic law requires ijtihad. So therefore, we respect the differences of opinion among us in those things. May Allah give us this gift. Because when we live like this, then we begin to respect each other. And then we begin to love each other more. And then we can work together. We can cooperate. We become happy to be a community. And when we are happy to be a community, we can do incredible things. One of the amazing things that I've seen in Islam is the fact that this religion has the power to release amazing creativity in men and women. You see that in a lot of converts. You see it in a lot of people um, you know, who uh, are from traditional Muslim families that Islam brings out of them this ability to contribute in extremely creative and beautiful ways. Okay, but that requires us to be happy. That requires us to be like a family. That requires us to work together. And this is the precious gift of Islam. May Allah Azza wa Jal give us humility. And may he give us the ability to respect ourselves. Often when we are disrespectful to other people, actually we are disrespectful to ourselves. A lot of times when people are really rough with each other and unforgiving, it's because they don't have any self-esteem themselves. This is why oppressed people especially oppressed people who have been oppressed for a long time so that they are defeated and they don't have self-esteem, they often hate each other. That can happen. It's strange, isn't it? And it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens a lot. Okay? So, you know, we have to be a community in which we cultivate self-esteem and in cultivating that self-esteem, we also cultivate esteem for the other. Our brother, none of you believes, the Blessed Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. That is a very serious hadith and all of you know it. But that is really, really the criterion that we have to go by. That we have to love for each other what we love for ourselves. Imam al-Nawawi and many other great scholars of Islam, when they talk about that beautiful hadith, they say, your brother here is your brother in Adam, your sister in Adam. None of you believes until he loves for all people what he loves for himself. You want to go to the garden. I want to go to the garden. You fear the judgment. I fear the judgment. Allah will ask us about every breath. He will ask us about every word. Are you ready for that? I'm not ready for that. That terrifies me. Okay? So we have to love for each other that we all get ready for that. ta'ala. And we ask Allah to guide our neighbors and to give them this gift. And we ask Allah also to bless communities like this wonderful community so that we welcome people. We bring people into this religion and we are very kind to them and very forgiving. You know, we don't say to them things that will drive them away because that is harmful. We cannot do that. And we say to them things that will benefit them ta'ala. One of the great scholars of Islamic history, he was called Shaykh al-Islam, Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, may Allah be pleased with him. Great, great man, 
great human being. And he was Shaykh al-Islam, mastered the Shafi'i school, mastered the Hanbali school, all of the Qira'at, the Hadith, Ilm al-Ikhtilaf, every Zahiri knowledge he mastered. And among his students were who? Nur al-Din Zengi, Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi. This was a great man, a great man. But he said, you can sum up all of Islam in two words. As-sidqu ma'al-haqq wa husnu al-khuluqi ma'al-khalq. All of Islam in that. As-sidqu ma'al-haqq. That we are absolutely truthful to God who is the real. May we all be like that because we will meet him. We will meet him absolutely sure. And that day is a difficult day. As-sidqu ma'al-haqq. May we be truthful with God and truthful with each other. And husnul al khuluqi ma'al-khalq. And good character with people. Good character with all creation. May Allah give us that gift bi idhnillahi ta'ala. It's a great joy to be here with you. It's like visiting cousins and nephews and uncles and aunts. And I remember the old days, of course, there are beautiful faces in this crowd on this side and this side that I remember from how many decades ago? <laughs> 31 years ago, 31 years ago. MashaAllah, but those were beautiful times. And um, you know, may Allah have mercy on those of us who were together at that time who are no longer here, like our beloved uncle Asim Hussein. Allah have mercy upon him. He was a good man. Let's recite Al Fatiha for him, for his wife Rafi'a, uh, for our brother Dawood Tawhidi, and for all others, you know, of that great community, you know, that are not with us now. Al Fatiha. So we ask Allah to give us the beautiful word and especially when we talk with each other it is never valid to tell your brother or sister something that hurts them, something that harms them, something that drives them away. Do it beautifully. Imam al-Ghazali says, if the greatest innovator in the world came to me, the greatest mubtadi', the worst mubtadi', he said, what you should do is take him aside, give him a cup of tea, give him some food, be really nice to him, talk to him, and by that try to bring him to the truth. Because he said, if you argue with him and argue with him, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. He said, you know, you'll overwhelm him, and if you're like Imam al-Ghazali, he won't have anything to say. But he'll say, you're just really good at argumentation. We've got people back where I come from who are just as good. If they could come here, they would convince you. So it's very good to use wisdom, bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. May Allah give us the ability to do that. May He give us good opinion. The Prophet taught us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that husnul dhanni min husnul ibadah. He told us that to have a good opinion of ourselves and of others is a type of good worship. A lot of times the things that lead to trouble up between us are because we don't have a good opinion of each other. And that in itself is not a good place to begin. May we uh, work together and inshallah I hope and pray that you know in this time when it's easy, relatively easy to go back and forth that the communities of Chicago and the communities of Michigan and the communities of Canada, because they're here today too. Brothers and sisters came down from Toronto and probably other places that we can put our hands together ta'ala, and do really good work that is beneficial for us, our children, and all people. I mean, uh, let's stop here and uh, I think that we could entertain questions if we still have time for that. Thank you very much. Wait, yeah, I'm dead.
This is coming from Canada. I'm dead. He's warm down here. He's warm. Uh, very good question. So our brother is asking, is consensus in Islam restricted to qat'i, definitive matters, or also to dhanni matters? According to my understanding of Islamic law and legal theory, one of the most important functions of consensus is that it takes something which would have been dhanni had it been left on its own and it makes it a matter that is qat'i. So this is why consensus is one of the usul al-deen. It is one of the fundamental sources of the religion. When we have consensus on a matter among the companions, the successors, the great imams and mujtahids, then that becomes very solid ground. That becomes very solid ground. Yes? Uh, and do you have an example? Would you like to give me an example of that? And uh, do you have a particular bad habit in mind? Drugs, okay. So um, drugs are haram. Drugs are not just a bad habit. Drugs are haram. And drugs are extremely destructive. And we don't have to talk about that. I mean, drugs have become so widespread in our community today that I would imagine that most of us here, including myself, we have painful experiences in the people we love. And even our own flesh and blood, nephews and cousins and others, you know, of how horribly these drugs destroy people. So that is an extremely serious matter. And that is a matter that pertains to the haram. Thank you very much. May Allah protect our communities from that. Drugs are destroying this society. They are extremely harmful. They are extremely harmful. And wherever they go, they begin to take the people apart. And they take the society apart. May Allah enable us to close that door and never open it. Ameen. Amruhum shura baynahum. You know, Muslims do things by counsel. So when we have problems in our community, in many Muslim communities, for example, you have people that are actually dealing in drugs in the community. Uh, that's a problem that happens many places in the United States. Okay, if that problem occurs, then it must be dealt with. And this is something that requires counsel, it requires wisdom, it requires legal knowledge and other things like that. But it cannot be neglected as if it were not there. You know, you could, you've got to save that person himself or herself. And then you've got to protect the community as well. So there is no simple answer to that question. You know, call 911. You know, it's something that, again, the community must deal with. You have your imam, you have your boards of directors, you have very intelligent people in your communities, uh, you have great scholars, and so forth. So these are things that we have to sit down and talk about. And maybe, you know, you can approach the family, maybe you can approach uncles, 
Uh, you know, there might be other ways to do it, but these are very serious things. Drugs are extremely serious. Wa alaykum as And especially, sister, whether it would cause greater harm, first of all. Whether it will benefit them is the second question. The other one is whether it will cause harm, because if it will cause harm, greater harm, then you have to do something else. You have to go about it differently. Okay. So our sister's question is that um, when we see that people are doing something that's haram and you know at what point like and we're not sure if it will cause harm or if it will cause benefit then uh, how do we go about that, right? H how do we approach this issue? Very, very good question. I think one of the things that we should point out here is that in Islamic law, enjoining right and forbidding wrong have always been class, classified as a community obligation. Okay, so it is not fardul ayn, it is not an individual obligation, it is fardul kifaya, it is a societal obligation. Okay, now what does that mean? What that means is that in the community, the community has that responsibility, but not you necessarily. You may not be able to do it, but you have an imam. You have other imams. You have people who have the knowledge and the trust, men and women. You have also emruhum shura baynahum, they counsel. So this is why in our communities, there should be people like the imam and like the people with the imam who are entrusted with this obligation and who are also trained to do it, who have the knowledge to do it. And so therefore, this makes it easier for you because if you know that so-and-so is doing something haram, watching pornography, for example, or so-and-so is not doing something wajib, like praying the five daily prayers, Okay, then, and you don't know what you can do about that, and maybe you have tried, but it's had no effect whatsoever. So then you could bring that to the attention of the committee, the imam and the people with him, and then they see what is the best way to deal with this. And traditionally in Islamic society, we were very good at things like that. Again, in traditional Islamic societies, we were very polite people, very civil people, very civilized people. And we tended to go about correcting things in remarkable ways because we don't want to tear the society apart. We want to build it. Very good question. Um, yes, okay. Right. There's also a question back there. Yeah, go ahead. No, you go ahead. But uh, so this is what Brother Rizwan is saying that often in our communities we have men and women. Uh, Saif, I'm sorry, Saif, I, I, I got you confused with Rizwan, okay? But sometimes in our community, um, you know, we have people who have the best of intentions, but in their enjoining right or forbidding wrong, they make a mess of things. 
Is that true? That's what you're saying? So what do we do about that? And again, our religion is a religion of teaching and knowledge and guidance. And we have to train our community that there are certain communal etiquettes that we have. And that there's a certain way we behave. If uh, you come to my house, you're going to behave very politely. And if I go to your house, I'm going to behave, inshallah, very politely. When we come to the house of Allah, we have to behave very politely. And one of the things that our great scholars say is that to speak about Islam without knowledge, like saying, this is haram, but you don't know that it's haram. You just think it is. Or that this is obligatory, but you don't know if it's obligatory. You never studied that. It's just your opinion that that is more sinful than adultery and fornication. And yet, many people in our communities do that. Hell, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. We have to be very careful in what we do. Okay, and we have to teach each other very politely and very kindly, hold your tongue, hold your tongue. One of the worst things about disputation, argumentation, is the fact that these are ways that we insult other people. And we may see that I'm doing this for the sake of Allah, but in reality, we are condemning that person. We are looking down on that person. So we have to make our communities safe spaces, you know, where people can come here and not live in fear that they will be insulted and embarrassed and abused. It should be possible for a man who is not even practicing his Islam to come back and to do tawbah, or for a woman who is not even practicing her Islam to come back and to do tawbah. And we must make our mosques welcoming spaces where we can take back people and build them up again. And this doesn't mean that we will alter what we believe to be right. No, it doesn't mean that at all. But it just means that we try to perfect our faith so that we are kind to each other. We are forgiving to each other. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. May Allah enable us to do that. It is one of the most important responsibilities of our scholars to teach our community. And, to t and this is what we should be doing in things like Friday prayer is teaching our community, what do we do in a case of enjoining right or forbidding wrong? What do we do if we see a certain thing in the mosque? And who should be told that? Okay, I, I know of an instance in Chicago that I'll never forget, this happened about 10 years ago, where a brother embraced Islam, he was brand new in Islam, and he had gold earrings in his ear. And he came into a mosque and one of the men in the community was infuriated by that. Like, you've got earrings and they're gold. And he came up to him like a lion and just told him, this is haram and you cannot do this and, and other things like that. Okay, so like, first of all, gold earrings. Is that a matter of absolute consensus in Islam, that that's forbidden? Because Imam al-Shafi'i, may Allah be pleased with him, has an opinion that if the earring is coated with gold, but not solid gold, that it is not haram, it's makru. Okay, so did you know that? And then secondly, will this cause greater harm? Let's say that there is consensus on that, and none of us likes gold earrings. Imam al-Shafi'i doesn't like gold earrings, okay? But if we uh, tell him this, and he's a new Muslim, will it cause harm? In this case, he left Islam. Because he said, I didn't become a Muslim for this. And he walked out on the street, and he didn't come back. 
That is huge harm. And who will be responsible for that? The man who did that because you were not supposed to do this. You were not supposed to do this. So may Allah give us wisdom. May he enable us to live together with complete adab. Adab is so beautiful. Courtesy is so beautiful. And it enables us then to grow together and to respect each other. Okay, we had a brother back here. Did you want to ask your question? Yes. Wa alaikum as -salam. So your question is that if a person has good intention, but what he does causes more harm than good, then is there sin in that, right? And our scholars would say, yes, there is. You know, because of the fact you have to be wise in the way that you do this. And it is not valid to enjoin right or forbid wrong when you believe that in the act of doing that, you will cause an even worse situation than the one that we had. Again, a lot of us are compelled to enjoin right and forbid wrong because it's like, but this is my responsibility. And Allah will take me to account if I don't do it. But that's not the full picture. You have to be wise. Allah will not take you to account if you do this and it caught, if you don't do this because you don't want to create greater harm. And he will take you to account if you do this and you cause harm. Remember the better one who came into the Prophet's mosque in Medina? The Prophet's mosque, as you all know, didn't have a floor like this. It didn't have a carpet. It was pebbles and stone and, and clay. And the Bedouin comes in. The Bedouin's not accustomed to civilization. And the mosque is fairly large. And so he goes into a corner and he squats and he begins to relieve himself to pass urine. And the Sahaba want to take him. Like, this is the mosque of Allah. And what does the Prophet do? He holds them back. Right? And then he, he, the, when the Bedouin is finished, he says, put water on it. And then he makes it very clear that, that the mosques of Allah are not for this. So we have to follow the way of our Prophet. Had they gone and done that, had they gone and grabbed the Bedouin and maybe make him urinate on himself in the process, what would he have done? It's very likely that he would have apostated and left Islam. Okay, so the Prophet treated him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in a very wise way and a very merciful way. Yeah, Bismillah. Wa alaikum as -salam. Um, so the question is about Imam Al-Hussein. May Allah be pleased with him, the great Imam Al-Hussein. And um, the question is about, it seems to me, what was the wisdom of his going to Iraq and uh, confronting the Umayyad forces in the way that he did. And of course this led to a great uh, tragedy, which was the killing of him, all of the males of his family, except for Ali ibn Hussein, Zayn al Abidin, and other things. And uh, this is an issue which our scholars, first of all, don't have consensus on. 
Some great scholars hold that Imam al Hussein was not going to fight, that Imam al Hussein was going to immigrate and to go to the East. Okay, that is a valid scholarly op opinion, and they base that on the fact that he took with him his women and his children. And you don't take your women and children to battle. So some people say that what he wanted to do was to leave and to go out of the Hijaz and out of Iraq and maybe go to Central Asia or someplace else. Uh, that is a valid scholarly opinion. Other scholars don't hold that opinion. They hold an opinion similar to your own. Um, some people would also say that Imam al Hussein, the ones who would say that he went there to confront the Umayyads, did so because he was promised by supporters in Kufa that they would support the, him. And those very people are the ones who betrayed him. So uh, the people of Medina never betrayed Imam al Hussein. The people of Medina loved Ahlul Bayt and they stood by Ahlul Bayt. Imam Abu Hanifa was that way, Imam Malik was that way, Imam Shafi'i was that way. They never betrayed them ever. They loved them, they stood by them. But um, the case of Imam Al Hussein is not an easy situation to deal with. And um, it is one of the things that our scholars refer to as Sirrul Qadr. It is one of the secrets of destiny and it is hikmatun majhula. It is an unknown wisdom. So the suffering of Ahlul Bayt, if we wanted to talk about that, um, none of us could keep from crying. The things that the, the Ahlul Bayt have been through in history is very, very sad. What was God's wisdom in that? And one of his wisdoms was that he spread them east and west in Africa, in Asia, you know, in many places. And out of this beautiful tree came incredible people, incredible men and women. And in any case, we ask Allah to give us love of the Prophet, love of the companions. The companions loved the house of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the love of Ahlul Bayt and to have a good opinion of them all bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Yes. Wa alaikum as -salam. Yeah. Okay, so our sister has a very good question here. We, we mentioned the word apostate. That's a big word. It's a very big, murtad, it's a big word. And she said that, you know, what do we do about apostates? Because we have apostates in our community. Uh, one thing that is very important to understand is that in Islamic law, what we call hudud punishments, these are never permissible to apply in a non-Muslim governance. Okay, that you can't do that. So uh, the way that the law is applied with an imam in an Islamic governance is one thing. The way that you apply Islam outside of the Islamic governance, as in this community, where we are here like a protected community, we are a covenanted community, it's very different. We do not take the law into our hands and we are not vigilantes and we are not allowed to do that. A lot of times we hear on the right wing about hudud, punishments and so forth. And the thing is, is that whatever we have to say about these punishments and how they are applied and what they are, they cannot be applied here. You've got nothing to worry about. We can't do that. We're not allowed to do that. But uh, in the case of brothers and sisters who apostate, we have to help them back. We have to help them back. These are not easy times that you and I are living in. And for a lot of our young people, 
they may be going through difficulties that you and I can't remember. Okay, they live in a world that has in it temptations and difficulties that are very, very hard for a lot of us who are older to understand. Okay, so we have to be merciful. We have to be merciful. And um, we have to try to bring people back. And often they do come back. You know, and uh, it's said that atheists are almost always atheists because of what they saw, quote unquote, believers doing. <clears throat> so we don't want to be like that. We want to give these people a chance to come back and to be healthy and to flourish, bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Our communities have to be welcoming. Our communities have to be that way, bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Okay? Okay, I, I'm not. Okay, bismillah. And when you talk about dealing with your own children, uh, what specifically do you have in mind? Yeah, may Allah bless our children and bless their parents. And my wife and I, you know, mashallah, many of you know my wife, many of these beautiful people here, because she was here with me when we were here. We've been married for 41 years, mashallah. And uh, she has been one of the pillars of my life. I, I wouldn't be able to do very much without her. You know, but we were actually saying, it's so nice to be old. <laughs> <laughs> we were saying that after our daughter called with one of her problems, our children, our children, and we said, it's so nice to be old, <laughs> you know, grandmother and grandfather, right? I don't envy you. I don't envy you because, um, you know, th that's a difficult road. But one of the things that I have been taught and that I truly believe is that the greatest thing of all, you want your children to grow up loving Islam. You know, we have a beautiful brother here right now who has 11 children and 28 grandchildren. And I've known him for 30 some years, you know, and he was telling me tonight that, you know, mashallah, all of his children are in Islam. They live and breathe Islam, and his grandchildren as well, and they love to pray. Okay, what's the secret? And what I was taught and what I believe, and what I know is true of this brother, is that the husband and wife love each other. The husband and wife stand by each other. There's a poet who says, my mother and father are two streams that come together in my heart. So one of the main things that we can do as mothers and fathers to help our children is to love each other as husband and wife. And that's why, and I know also that we live in a time in which marriage is often very difficult. And I don't want to discourage anybody by talking about that ideal, which a lot of us find very difficult to reach. But that's something we have to understand, that when the husband and wife disdain each other, look down on each other, and this happens a lot. They don't love each other, they don't want to be around each other. That abuses the child, because me, as a son, the thing that I am most proud of 
in the world is not the car my father drives or the house he lives in or the clothes he bought me or the delicious food that he put on the table, but that he loves my mother and he understands my mother and she loves him, right? And uh, that's why we want to make our marriages work bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. And there are many children who come from difficult families and broken families and they're still really gems. Okay, Allah bless them. But if you look around and you see the children like the children of this brother, you will see that these children are strong children. And they are actually quite happy in Islam. And then look at the mother and father. And I can show you case after case where those mothers and fathers love each other. And although they've been married for 20 years or 30 years or more, it's still like the first day and the first night. That is one of the greatest gifts that Allah can give us. May Allah give that to all of us. Okay, and then the children will inherit that from you. But when you raise children, you know, be ready for the rodeo. Right? Be ready for it because children, even if you do love your husband or if he loves you, when they get to a certain age, they often don't want to hear a thing you have to say. And they want to say the Power, empowering word, no, I'm not going to do that. So that's a hard thing to go through. It's a very hard thing to go through. And here, it's like bring the children up well, give them lots of love. And the most important love that the mother and father give their children is the love the mother and father have for each other. And also other things as well. Dhikr. Remembering the name of Allah. You know, the angels that carry the throne. Do you know how big the throne of Allah is? Do you have any idea? You take the first heavens, which are the ones you can see, and if you were to put them in the second heaven, the first heaven, which is this huge heaven you see above us, would be like a coin, a ring, that is thrown away in a desert. And the second heaven, in the third heaven, is like a coin thrown away in a desert. And every heaven is like that. And when you get to the seventh heaven, which is the biggest of all, if you were to take that and put it and compare it to the kursi. What is the kursi? Am I sitting on a kursi? No. Kursi is a footstool. Kursi is not a chair. The kursi is the footstool of the throne. The king puts his feet on the kursi. Even though today we call this a kursi in Arabic, but in the Arabic of the Qur'an, the kursi is the footstool. Okay? Uh, the seventh heaven in the kursi is like a coin thrown away in a vast desert. And the Prophet told us the arsh, the throne of God, has no likeness. It is the greatest thing that God created. And it's carried by eight angels. Angels are the most powerful of all beings in creation. And the Prophet saw Gabriel alayhi salam, with all of his wings spread out from one horizon to another. Can you imagine how powerful he is, Gabriel? He took the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and lifted them up and turned them over and crashed them down. And that lake which was there, and we know from archaeological records that there was a lake there and that there was a city of Sadum and Ramura. We know it was there. And it becomes the lowest place on the face of the earth and the water is so salty you can't hardly drown in it. Okay, Gabriel does that. And there are eight angels that carry the throne of Allah. Eight, how big are they? How huge are they? And what did they do? Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah al azim Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah al azim They glorify Allah. And that's why when you say those words, Subhanallah wa bihamdihi, Subhanallah al azim the throne vibrates because you are now matching what the angels say. And what else do those angels say? 
They ask forgiveness for you. They ask forgiveness for the believers. Okay? So this is what we are all about. You know, this is what the human being is. Human being is a very special creature. And, uh, you know, if we give our children the beauty of the dhikr, Allah bi dhikrillahi tatma'inna al qulub, it's only with the mentioning of Allah that these hearts actually find peace. Then it's like giving them a rope and they will go a little bit this way, a little bit that way, but they'll come back bi idhnillahi ta'ala. But we ask Allah to protect our children. In many Muslim communities in the United States today, I don't want to even say what the percentage is. There is a large percentage of our young men and women who don't have much to do with us. Okay, and that's not good. That's not right. We have to turn that around. We have to be merciful. Bi idhnillahi ta'ala. Inshallah. Okay, I, I think. Let's ask this little bottle, this hero, this warrior over here. What's your question? Ah, oh, very good. MashaAllah, very good question. And the fact is, is that the kursi, the footstool, it cannot even be compared to a ring. Because the arsh, the throne of Allah is so big, we can't even make a comparison. Isn't that amazing? Those are actually very important matters, very important matters. Um, you know, they're part of our theology. They are extremely important, even for physics. Even for physics. You know, one of the most essential beliefs of secular atheism is the belief in empty space. And we don't believe in that. We believe that there is a lot of area out there. But we don't believe in empty space where there's nothing at all. So these are all very important beliefs. May Allah enable us to learn this blessed religion and live this blessed religion and give it to ourselves and our children and our grandchildren and then give it to all the people around us. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Bi-idhnillahi ta'ala. Allahumma wafiqna li ma tuhibbuhu wa tarda. وَجَعَلْنَا مِنْ عَبِيدِكَ السُّعَدَاءَ وَأَمِّتْنَا عَلَى كَلِمَةِ الْهُدَىٰ عَلِّمْنَا مَا يَنْفَعُنَا وَوَفِّقْنَا لِلْعَمَلِ بِمَا عَلَّمْتَنَا بِهِ وَاجْعَلْ مَا نَحْنُ فِيهِ خَالِسًا مُخْلِسًا لِوَجْهِكَ الْكَرِيمِ يَا رَبَّ الْعَالَمِينَ اللهم اهدنا إلى أحسن الأخلاق لا يهدي إلى أحسنها إلا أنت واصرف عنا سيئها لا يصرف عنا سيئها إلا أنت اللهم وفقنا لأيسر العبادات وأهونها على البدن الصمت وحسن الخلق اللهم اجعل تجمعنا هذا تجمعا مرحوما وتفرقنا بعد ان تفرقا معصوما لا شقيا منا ولا محروما It's an honor to be with you and may Allah make us one family bi-idhnillahi ta'ala and may he join us together all of us in the garden bi-idhnillahi ta'ala